Okay, we will now advance three weeks to the fourth and final meeting of the Pandemic Emergency Board on December 18th, 2019. Okay, thank you for reconvening, and let's get an update from Dr. Rivers. <laughs> In the last three weeks, case numbers have continued to grow exponentially. We now have an estimated 4.2 million cases and 240,000 deaths. Almost every country is now reporting cases, and those who aren't may simply not have the resources to conduct surveillance. We don't see any change in the rate of rapid spread, and models estimate that we could have more than 12 million cases and close to a million deaths by mid-January. We're not sure how big this could get, but there's no end in sight. Financial markets are universally down by 15% or more on the year. Fear of a catastrophic pandemic and uncertainty about the capacity for governments to respond and remain viable are fueling investor uncertainty. We have called this meeting today because of major strategic problems around communication that are happening globally. And here is a media debate that just happened on air today. Alarming news emerging from social media companies today about the CAPS pandemic. Twitter and Facebook are reporting they've identified and deleted a disturbing number of accounts dedicated to spreading disinformation about the outbreak. For more on this, we go to our correspondent, Catalina Parks. Chen, these accounts were created by several state-sponsored groups intending to sow political discord, and some individuals are seemingly seeking to gain financial advantages. Violence against healthcare workers and minority populations has been increasing. A recent riot highlights the real danger in these posts. Countries are reacting in different ways as to how best to manage the overwhelming amounts of dis and misinformation circulating over the internet. In some cases, limited internet shutdowns are being implemented to quell panic. Thank you, Catalina. For more on this, we are joined by experts on crisis communications and social media. Kevin McAleese and Sarah Lee. To me, it is clear countries need to make strong efforts to manage both mis- and disinformation. We know social media companies are working around the clock to combat these disinformation campaigns. The task of identifying every bad actor is immense. And experts agree that new disinformation campaigns are being generated every day. This is a huge problem that's going to keep us from ending the pandemic and might even lead to the fall of governments, as we saw in the Arab Spring. If the solution means controlling and reducing access to information, I think it's the right choice. I agree with Kevin. This is a big problem and doesn't even account for the massive amounts of misinformation being generated by legitimate users about the pandemic. But it's not just trolls who are spreading the fake news. It's often political leaders themselves. Who's to judge what's real or not? Would we trust every government to separate truth from lies? I think this is more than just keeping the bad information out. It's also about making sure real public health information reaches the public. News is found from outlets other than social media. News organizations, public health groups and companies need to help people take the right actions to protect themselves by promoting accurate, real information about the outbreak. Okay, for more on this, we're gonna get a briefing from our communications expert, Dr. Sell. Global health experts have highlighted that dis and misinformation are wreaking havoc on the CAPS response. Health workers are under attack in a number of locations due to rumors that they are purposely spreading the disease. And response efforts in many places have had to be suspended because of concerns around violence. Pharmaceutical companies are being accused of introducing the CAPS virus so they can make money on drugs and vaccines and have seen public faith in their products plummet. Unrest due to false rumors and divisive messaging is rising and is exacerbating, exacerbating spread of the disease as levels of trust fall and people stop cooperating with response efforts. This is a massive problem, one that threatens governments and trusted institutions. Polls have shown that mis- and disinformation are ubiquitous. At least 90% of the public has been exposed to these messages. At the same time, misinformation messages come from a variety of sources, even government officials. And often, governments are contradicting one another. We know that social media is now the primary way that many people get their news. So interruptions to these platforms could curb the spread of misinformation, but could also limit access to information from legitimate sources. 
health ministries around the world are attempting to combat mis- and disinformation by amplifying public health messaging through social and traditional media. But they are being outpaced by false and misleading information. National governments are considering or have already implemented a range of interventions to combat misinformation. Some governments have taken control of national access to the internet. Others are censoring websites and social media content. And a small number have shut down internet access completely to prevent the spread of misinformation. Penalties have been put in place for spreading harmful falsehoods, including arrests. Other countries have taken a more moderate approach and have focused on promoting fact-checking efforts and working with traditional media outlets, yet these approaches are limited in scope. Social media companies report that they're doing all they can to limit the use of their platforms for nefarious or misleading purposes. But this is a technically difficult problem, and false, misleading, or half-true information is difficult to sort without limiting potentially true messages. The bottom line is that members of the public no longer know who to trust. Both the misinformation and the measures to control it have led to a crisis of confidence. Thank you, Dr. Sell. So here's the policy crisis for this meeting of the board. How can governments, international businesses, international organizations ensure that reliable information is getting to the public and prevent highly damaging and false information to the extent that's possible about the pandemic from spreading and causing deepening crisis around the world. How much control of information should there be? And by whom? And how can false information be effectively challenged? And what if that false information is coming from companies or from governments? So your views are welcome. So I would start by pursuing where trust exists in the ecosystem. Uh, Jane, in a prior meeting, uh, mentioned that there's considerable trust by employees of their employer, and that's been borne out um, by our own trust barometer in, in the last several years, where there is, it's extraordinary the amount of trust given to the employer. And coupled with that, in times of crisis as we're living, the role of the CEO mm -hmm. And the trust given to the CEO for advocacy and for uh, advancement of accurate information is considerable. I would marry the business leadership of the employer with business leadership organizations, such as the BRT and like enterprises around the globe. Um, but I also think we're at a moment where the social media platforms have to step forward and recognize the moment to assert that they're a technology platform and not a broadcaster is, is over. Um, they, in fact, have to be a participant in broadcasting accurate information and partnering with the scientific and health communities mm -hmm. to counterweight, if not flood the zone, of accurate information. Because to, try, to put the genie back in the bottle of the misinformation and disinformation is nigh impossible. So flood. Flood, flood good zone. information. Okay, others, yeah, Jane. Yeah, so can, can I uh, agree with that? And my fact, it did come from the Edelman Trust Index, you'll be pleased to know, um, but also borne out by the work I've done as a CEO in my time. Can I also add that I think there are real technology opportunities here. I, I personally do not believe that trying to shut things down in terms of information is either practical or desirable. And we do have, I think, a, a couple of strategies that are available to us, one of which is the flood strategy, second of which is relying and informing and equipping trusted uh, sources of information with the facts so they can then pass that on. But we also need to actually think about a technological answer to this. So there is work that's being done to actually create algorithms to sift through information on these kind of social media platforms. Um, and I know that uh, the Gates Foundation and others are funding organisations to work on things like this in order that people can actually have more confidence in the sources that they will use in any event. So okay. I think both uh, uh, a detailed solution working with individuals, but then also thinking about technology is something we have to advance. Hi, Steve. So uh, looping back into the trust barometer, last year in Davos it was released that 
trust in traditional media sources has grown, while trust in social media sources has gone down specifically after the last elections in the United States. So I think one of the ways that we need to approach this is to make sure that we have the right representatives on traditional media networks in order to uh, portray our side of the story and make sure that there, there isn't um, misinformation. I agree with Jane that shutting down internet is only going to cause extra panic and extra anxiety. Um, in fact, that staff tells me places where internet access has been shut down, there's unrest growing. So uh, we're not only dealing with this specific situation, but really people not trusting their governments at this point. And so I think we really need to make sure, one, from a news perspective, that that information being, is b being disseminated correctly and that we have the right resources out there um, to provide this information. I also think that there is a good point in trusting in employees, in your employers. Um, there are lots of communications channel, for example, during the Ebola crisis at Texas Children's Hospital. Um, we had daily briefings with the CDC to tell us what the situation was. And because of the daily briefings, we used between the intranet, internal global communications, and town halls. Uh, we use those sources to be able to disseminate information and make sure that our employees knew exactly what was going on, coming straight from the source, whether it was from our um, CEO, our chief nursing officer, or others within the hospital. Okay, Tim yeah, and I, Chris, I'm oh, sorry. No, I think a, a complementary uh, tactic too is to to tap faith-based organizations <clears throat> and civil society and other institutions to recruit them also. To, to, to basically, almost at a grassroots level, continue to, to basically have the integrity of, of the information. So I just pick up on the daily briefings, or twice daily briefings. Um, during H1N1, WHO filled the parking lot in Geneva <coughs> with the, the, the global press and provided them daily updates on what was happening. And I think that's, that's, that's a manifestation of flood, meaning you have to lead and lead regularly. And I think in the terms of the content is what we know and uh, point to where communications have actually been pretty good. I think we projected the exponential increase in this quite well uh, and therefore there's legitimacy to what's mm -hmm. being communicated. Uh, and so be clear about what's being communicated that we know and that is right. But also be very clear about communicating what is absolutely wrong. Uh, and being clear about that, and then also being clear about uncertainty and that that's being managed. So I think in those three domains, it's very important not to, not to deny, <coughs> uh, but to speak to them very clearly in the context of a daily briefing from, in this case, I can't imagine any other institution than WHO uh, being the focal point. Martin and, and Chris, and then I'll come down this line. Thank you. I fully, fully agree that uh, this is pure crisis communication, and crisis communication today, also social media is part of it. And just to limit or even, or even stop social media would create a huge damage. And uh, we should use it. We should uh, get it on our side. We should work together with them, and we should try to avoid this mis misinformation. And uh, another topic is, I mean, our, our industry, there are indications, meanwhile, that we are getting in this uh, social uh, conspiracy theory topic, that we are part of this conspiracy theory, that we are uh, supporting this, that uh, wealthy countries will spread out caps to, to poorer countries. And this is a clearly, clearly thing of social media that could be directed via clear crisis communication and confirmed and regular updated information. So I also agree with Matthew, companies' this, uh, uh, responsibility that the CEO talks to the staff, that the CEO improves this information flow, and then we have a chance to get it channeled. So are, in this case, are governments, do you think governments are at the point where they need to require social media companies to operate in a certain way? I hear you saying social media companies should not be impaired. Yep. But are they, do they need to operate under different conditions? I think Matt alluded to that as well. Uh, yes, I would say that there are specific conditions now, and we have to find a way to cooperate, and we have to find solutions for this, okay. but not to hamper them. Chris? So I just want to build on Ed's comment about the importance of civil society and faith-based communities. I think in, you know, in addition to employers, um, people trust their neighbors, trust their local community organizations. With three million cases in the Americas, you know that local communities around the countries have been responding, whether it's to manage daycare so people can stay in school um, or go to, go to work. So the, you know, while the social media can provide better quality information, I think actually local community organizations can help individuals understand how to filter out some of the noise 
and to act on the good, good information that's there. I think it's an important lesson that we've learned recently. We're learning as we speak in, in East Africa with the Ebola outbreak. If you don't have the community trust and engagement, you can't deliver even effective countermeasures, even when you have them. So I think the importance of local community, perhaps married to and as a filter for helping to discern the truth from the misinformation on the, on the technology platforms is going to be an important part of this response. Mm -hmm. right, Steve, Brad, and then we'll go down the table here. I, just two points. Um, first is that um, we have to recognize that we are all susceptible to misinformation based on our, our prob beliefs and experience. And I think with the social media platforms, there's an opportunity to understand um, who it is that's susceptible in what form to misinformation. So I think there's an opportunity to collect data from the from from that uh, communication um, mechanism. The second thing is, with that um, ability, we can identify false information more quickly. We are actually uh, receiving reports about um, people trying treatments that are uh, purported to be effective but are actually harmful. And the quicker we that's recognized and can be be countered, the the fewer people will fall susceptible to those things. Okay, thanks, Brad. Yeah, I don't want to be repetitive. I agree with almost everything that was said. But uh, when we talk about our health, who do we typically trust? Our physician. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about that right now. So, I mean, we need the, uh, physicians and the medical community uh, really out there on the forefront talking about this. I remember I had access to local news in Atlanta when the patient was uh, taken care of uh, for Ebola that came back. And uh, physicians were on there nightly talking about, you know, don't panic. It's okay. Mm -hmm. This isn't going to go spread. So. I would add physicians to it. Okay. Yeah. That's some important news to share from our, um, our member companies. Rumors are actually spreading that the antivirals are causing gaps, and so um, patients are, are not taking them anymore. And, and uh, this is particularly an area where we have government mistrust. On the other hand, it's interesting because we are doing clinical trials in, in new antiretrovirals, and in fact, in vaccines and social media, including Facebook, is actually enhancing recruitment. People are going to it. And they're actually seeking information on where they can participate and sign up. And so I sort of wonder that maybe we're in the mistake of reporting and counting all the fatalities and infections, and we're not sharing with people what are the wins. You know, who are the, who are the patient advocates that can say, what worked for me, and maybe you should try that. I think we, we have an opportunity here. OK. Did George. And then yeah. Real. Um, oh, sorry. You go ahead. No, no, no. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, you know, by now, you know, we have um, more, more cases in China and also death cases reported. And also uh, my staff told me uh, that before there's misinformation and uh, there's some belief, people believe, you know, this is a man-made, man uh, pharmaceutical company made the virus. So there are some violations and even, you know, death is because of this misinformation. Um, as a, you know, from a, like the CDC, and you know, I don't know if Steve, believe, uh, Steve agree with me, uh, when you are doing the field work and you like to do some so-called TOT, training of trainers. So we really need to, uh, to train the health workers, especially the health care workers, their access to the patients, to the public. So make sure they, they got the <coughs> right information. So not necessarily, you know, sometimes the health care workers, they know something. But they, if they are not well trained, they might give the wrong information, but also they might say something, oh, I don't know. You know even I don't know, that could hurt. So when I remember that's, uh, that's such a situation remind me. When I was in Sierra Leone, you know, I was interviewed by radio, the national radio. I was asked by one of the audience to say, OK, we believe Ebola was man-made. It's transported from you know, somewhere. So this is, I think this is very important. We do the TOT. So make sure the health care workers have the mm. right information. OK, thank you. I real? very much agree with that. So I mean, I think I agree with a lot of what's been said. I just add to it maybe by saying that I think one of the things we want to do is work with telecommunication companies to actually ensure that everybody has access to the kind of communications that we're interested in providing, because that's going to be critical for dealing with, uh, you know, obviously the explosion of the disease. And, um, and then another issue, I suppose, is, is just through that, if you have a trusted source, I believe in the idea that we shouldn't be trying to um, control communication, but rather flood the zone, in a sense, with a trusted source that then is <coughs> influential 
community leaders as well as health workers, as Brad noted, and others on these issues in order to try to amplify the message that's coming through. And I think Tim's absolutely right. I certainly seen the value of communicating constantly on these issues so as to continue to, to deal with, uh, you know, sort of the vacuum that can be created in this circumstance. But then also with the comments made about the fact that for all of the disinformation that will be put out, it's going to be important to actually have a response to those questions and to those concerns, as Stephen said. And uh, and I understand from staff that actually there are also uh, intelligence sources identifying multiple foreign disinformation campaigns and so on. But it's all a part of a larger piece, which is to say that every time there is something that comes out that is, in fact, <coughs> false information that is starting to actually hamper our ability to address the pandemic, then we need to be able to respond quickly to it. So I have a number of comments here. <clears throat> People want to react to what I've real just said. I see a couple of fingers just went up. Mm -hmm. Matt and Tim. I think <laughs> just to, to build a little bit on what Avril said is, is, I think as in previous conversations where we've talked about centralization around management of information or pu public health uh, needs, there needs to be a centralized response around the communications approach that then is cascaded to informed advocates um, represented in the NGO communities, the medical professionals, et cetera. You mean centralized internationally? Be, centralized on an international basis um, because I think there needs to be a central repository of data, facts, and key messages. Tim, you wanted to comment on that, and then we'll go back to regular order here. Yeah, I, I think one important thing is it needs to there needs to be a, a sense of two-way communication, mm -hmm. which is uh, people on the front lines may be finding out that actually the system's not working as it should, and I, I think there should be a, a culture in the communications to feed back um, to authorities places where the system is broken down, where supplies are mm -hmm. short, where there are no health workers, where hospitals are dysfunctional. Etc. Because that, and then with some credible investigation process, which is uh, that then values the the, the client. The, the second dimension of it, I think, that's really important is that is to get individual narratives on this. I mean, the fact is that most people will survive, uh, and that's probably not a, a widespread public perception. And so, people who have lived and survived um, and can say that they got good care or that they were treated appropriately will help build confidence um, in, the, in the system in a way that perhaps the data doesn't do as effectively. Hasti, Latoya, Sophia, and then Jane. So I think a couple of things we have to consider are even before this began, the anti-vaccine movement was very strong. Mm -hmm. And this is something specifically through social media that has spread. So as we do the research to uh, come up with the right vaccines to help prevent the um, continuation of this. How do we get the right information out there? How do we communicate the right information to ensure that the public has trust in these vaccines that we're creating? Um, and secondly, uh, news organizations in some countries are right now uh, under a lot of pressure from their governments to provide politically favorable news. Mm -hmm. And so we have to think about you know, this isn't just the United States where we sometimes take the freedom of press for granted. There are countries where the news organizations are owned by the government and how are they um, disseminating information and what do we need to be thinking about? How do we communicate with those governments to ensure that um, misinformation and disinformation is not being spread? Thanks, right. Toya. That goes along with her. You know, I've received information from my staff saying there's, um, they're confused about the different authoritarian um, public health messages that are coming out from all the different sectors, the countries, the states, and uh, different cities. And they're concerned about the differences what the World Health Organization is you know, saying versus what their government is saying and what the total consensus are. So with that being said, you know, looking at hotels from that perspective, we're in a bind in knowing how to proceed. I see, Sophia? Um, thank you. I wanted to, I mean, the discussion is focusing on mis- and disinformation, but I think what's important to counter some of that is to actually put out information or good, good news stories of people who have actually beat the disease or uh, best practices in other parts of the world that is, is uh, delivering on um, results and sharing that. Um, but also, I agree on the point on having a, a centralized source of information and a world body that could have uh, garnered the respect of everyone. And I think the WHO in this instance might be that uh, source of information 
Um, and again, mm -hmm. using the UN networks on the ground in many of these countries um, has a UN presence through its mm -hmm. resident coordinator systems. And uh, I think based on the Edelman Trust Barometer, the UN still enjoys uh, a lot of trust yes. <laughs> around the world. So it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a good bet. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. So, so I, I just want to focus, if I could, for a second, on why we communicate, what the purpose of this communication mm -hmm. is. So there seem to be several elements to this conversation, one of which is to get the facts, however you define them, out there. But let's be completely clear. We have known for many years that tobacco kills you if you consume it. It's a fact. <coughs> and it's a crapshoot whether you're going to be in the 50% proportion who's going to die very young. But we know this as a fact. There are some things we know that are widely held. Doesn't mean it always changes people's behaviour. So I think we should also focus in a conversation about communication, about what the purpose of that communication is, and think about what we know about incentivizing the kind of behaviours we want to see. I agree with Tim completely. It needs to be two-way. So governments and people who are organising service delivery, um, businesses who are trying to operate in this environment, they can do that optimally. But we should also think in a communication sense, it's not just about handing people a piece of knowledge. It's also about how we incentivise them to manage their behaviours, which in any communicable disease outbreak, behaviour of one sort will minimise your chance of getting a disease versus behaviour of another sort, which may maximise that chance. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I just want to come back to the community. Uh, you know, judging from the statistics, we currently have uh, 4 million survivors. We may in a month have 11 million survivors. Assuming this is like other respiratory pathogens, they're now immune. And they, yeah. they live in the communities, almost by definition, that are affected. So can we turn the survivors into an effective community-based source of accurate information? They're going to be the least likely to be wanting spread false information. They're going to be motivated by having survived this outbreak and knowing loved ones who are also affected. I think they could become a very effective force for intervention at the community level. Thanks. I'm going to turn to Levon. I just want to ask one other question as, to think about as Levon's commenting. We've talked a lot about misinformation and flooding good information. We've just started to talk a bit about disinformation and the strategy around that. And I've real or others, if, after Levon comments, if you have any additional thoughts about the particular approaches to disinformation that may be distinguished from misinformation. It'd be good to hear about those. Yeah. But Levan. Uh, yeah, so I've received a note to say that some bad actors are actually using social media to spread rumors about specific companies in order to profit from short selling. So, you know, along, of, along the lines of what we've been talking about, you know, uh, this is going to cause companies to come up now to get some of their screen time as well because they need to spread the, the correct information. But one thing we haven't spoken about, and I'm wondering whether it's time to talk about this, is uh, a step up from the part of the governments on enforcement actions against fake news, right? Some, some of us, uh, this is new regulations that come in place about how we, we deal with fake news. And maybe this is a time for us to showcase some cases where we are able to to bring forward some bad actors and leave it before the courts to decide whether they have actually spread some fake news. So we have about three minutes left for this discussion. I just want to throw one more question out for your final thoughts on what if it is, as some people have raised, governments that are spreading misinformation either inadvertently or to some political advantage? How do we work around that with international organizations or business? Are there particular things that people haven't mentioned already that are worth talking about? But does anyone want to talk about either that or disinformation or other topics in the last couple of minutes? Sure. I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, please. <coughs> so can I have a very quick uh, one? So I want to talk, touch a little bit about science. I want to follow Chris' uh, talk. You know, because that's a very good chance we have survivors. Because we have so many survivors, mm -hmm. the epidemic already for two months. We have all these modern technologies and the platforms. And it's time to think about it, to, to try to isolate the human antibodies for this, because this is the, the very serious pandemic, but we want also to see the future. That will help science-based information. Thanks. Thanks. Avril? Sure. I, if you have state-sponsored disinformation, there's obviously additional tools that you can bring to bear to try to address that situation, not the least of which is bringing together other countries to effectively you know, take action against them for the kind of campaigns that they're propagating. But it's, um, But generally, I mean, I would say the disinformation 
the line between disinformation and misinformation is not always an easy one to find. Mm -hmm. And the reality is the greatest uh, you know, way to impact it, in my experience, is not to let it sit. So in other words, find your trusted interlocutors that are capable of saying this is not acceptable. This is, in fact, the truth. Here's the information. And I think the community of survivors is one example. But there's a whole series, employers, trusted faith leaders, variety of health workers, and so on can be part of that. In addition, obviously, you want to work with the private sector and those who are spreading information generally to see that they can bring things down that are, in fact, lies or uh, you know, false uh, information that's being put forward as a way to minimize it. But having a source, a national source, an international source, other trusted sources, and really guiding everybody towards that information is one of the most effective ways to deal with a situation like that. Great. I have Martin Tim. Yeah. If, it, if it comes back to misinformation on a level of governments, of, of countries, then we need, as Sophia mentioned, trustable international organizations, <coughs> UN, WHO, and they have to come together to get together to spread this trust and to work against this. We cannot hold governments from doing misinformation on their own. So I fully uh, trust on these organizations. Tom, just to build on that, I, I think you're right. It's important that uh, the UN and WHO remain very clear. But when they challenge governments directly, they often get into this issue of, of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important not to have that as the only response. I think it's really critical to think about soft uh, uh, power influence, uh, which is other um, influentials who can call up the head of state. Uh, or um, powerful constituencies within those countries. Uh, we've seen this in the context of mobilizing religious leaders in the context of polio, uh, uh, or specific business leaders where you can soften perhaps uh, a very hard line mm -hmm. from government um, through um, less, more stealth um, uh, um, in, in entry points rather than uh, trying to punish them through the international health mm -hmm. regulations or something like that. Great. And I, Adrian, I think last comment. I think it's important to think about what atypical <laughs> players in the private sector can we bring to bear in this. So bringing multinational pharmaceutical companies to talk about why, who are self-interested about why their products are safe could be seen as non-credible. But if I think about this, you know, the champion for TB in South Africa is Nando's Chicken. And so I think as we think about these large atypical players who have no credible vested interest in, in this issue but have a strong voice that's economically differentiated for their governments as well in their country, they're going to listen to them with some respect, I think would be very important. Okay, we're going to have to leave that conversation there. Thank you all for another very highly valuable discussion. We'll take what you've advised, bring it to the attention of leaders, and we deeply appreciate all you have done here in these meetings. This is concluded. Great. So that concludes the exercise portion of the event. Um, how did this pandemic turn out? We please watch this epilogue video and you can see the outcome. The outcome of the CAPS pandemic in event 201 was catastrophic. 65 million people died in the first 18 months. The outbreak was small at first and initially seemed controllable, but then it started spreading in densely crowded and impoverished neighborhoods of megacities. From that point on, the spread of the disease was explosive. Within six months, cases were occurring in nearly every country. At first, wealthy countries with advanced health care and public health systems were primarily able to limit the spread of the disease within their borders. As systems became overwhelmed, however, no countries were able to control its spread. And the disease affected people of all socioeconomic status, from the very poor to the extremely rich, from sanitation workers to CEOs and national leaders. The economic consequences were dramatic. The high death toll and even greater numbers of sick hurt productivity in many industries. Manufacturers were having trouble filling orders, and countless companies in the service sector simply shut down. The global economy was in a free fall the GDP down 11 percent. Stock markets around the world plummeted between 20 and 40 percent and headed into a downward cycle of fear and low expectation. Businesses were not borrowing. Banks were not lending. Everyone was just hoping to hunker down and weather the storm. 
While nearly all businesses were affected, certain sectors were especially hard hit. Travel, finance, service, manufacturing, healthcare, and insurance among them, with some major companies going bankrupt. And there were seismic societal consequences as well. The world saw large-scale protests and in some places riots. People were angry about the lack of access to health care and medicine, as well as government's inability to protect them from the disease. This led to violent crackdowns in some countries and even martial law. Political upheaval became the rule across the globe. The public lost trust in their respective administrations. Several governments fell, while others were desperately striving to hold on to power. This spurred further crackdowns. Attempts to control media messaging, originally aimed only at health-related misinformation, became used increasingly to quash political dissent. Economists say the economic turmoil caused by such a pandemic will last for years, perhaps a decade. The societal impacts, the loss of faith in government, the distrust of news, and the breakdown of social cohesion could last even longer. We have to ask, did this need to be so bad? Are there things we could have done in the five to 10 years leading up to the pandemic that would have lessened the catastrophic consequences? We believe the answer is yes. So are we as a global community now finally ready to do the hard work needed to prepare for the next pandemic?